Every film starts with an idea. The idea is what sparks the story that's based around that idea. That's what Pixar does. They ask a question and build a story around that question. What if toys come to life? What if cars come to life? What if superheroes are part of our everyday life? But out of every concept they've made, one stands out from the rest. Why do children claim to see monsters in their closet when they go to bed at night? Then they create the most interesting yet wacky explanation there could be. They work in a factory and harvest their screams to power their city. The concept alone is interesting enough to carry the whole film. But my next point for why this film is a masterpiece is because of the comedy in this movie, which mainly comes from Mike Wazowski. But Mike isn't just your typical comedic relief character. He also has a lot of depth in his character, but I'll get into that later. The comedy between this dynamic duo is just hilarious. Every joke lands, and half the time it doesn't even seem like they're trying to make a joke, but it just comes off as funny. Every line between these two characters just flows so naturally and feels so genuine. Now, let's talk about the characters. The characters are a big part of what makes a film great. Mike and Sully, while they can agree most of the time, they don't have the same motives and goals in life when Boo is thrown into the mix. She gives Sully a different perspective on life and makes him question the morality behind what they do to children. While Mike, on the other hand, is more worried about progressing their career and breaking the all-time scare record. In the Monsters at Work series, we hear Sully elaborate on how he felt when he scared Boo in the simulator. Their motives clash with each other when they get banished to the humor world and Mike questions if he will ever see Celia again and if their life will ever get back on track. While most films can easily set up an external conflict, having a character struggle with an internal conflict is how you build character, which is something very few films do nowadays in a world where it's all about hyping up the next big thing, trying to set up an epic fight scene or culmination. They set up a big bad villain where the odds are against the heroes, and in the end, the heroes prevail, and along the way, they don't have much development or get you to care about what they're actually fighting for in the first place because they're too worried about having some sort of big reveal or turn of events you wouldn't expect. And the main characters almost never disagree. Then, the villains. Mr. Waternoose doesn't act like your typical twist villain. We know from the beginning that he would do anything to keep his company from going under. I would do anything to keep it from going under. And even after he turns on Mike and Sully, it wasn't anything personal and it wasn't something he wanted to have to do. He isn't even fully in favor of Randall. I never should have trusted you with this. Because of you, I had to banish my top scarer. He just knows that he has an invention that will generate screams more efficiently and help boost his company in the public eye. Most stories could use an antagonist, but not every story needs a villain. An antagonist has motives behind their agenda. A villain just likes to be evil for the sake of being evil. Now, let's talk about the final point, story structure. Getting the concept of the world you're building across to your audience in a quick and effective way is essential for immersing your audience in the story. When you tell your audience about the context of your story, they shouldn't realize that they're being told. You could start your story the Disney fairy tale way with once upon a time there was a blank and then blank happened which caused us to end up where we are now. Your context should be picked up through bits and pieces of dialogue and actions that allow the viewer to piece it together for themselves. That's how you make an engaging story. Set it up as an unfolding world. Which is what this movie does. In the first scene, we see a child sleeping in his bedroom and seeing a monster creeping up to his bed and preparing to scare him. This conveys the message of monsters coming through children's closet doors to scare them. Then when he goes to scare him, he falls on the ground and starts screaming. This tells us that monsters are afraid of humans without directly telling us. Then it reveals that it's a simulation, which shows us that monsters train to scare children. Then Mr. Waternoose comes in and gives us a better explanation. And we know all this key information all before we even get introduced to our main characters. Then, going back to the point of an unfolding world, we see how they live in apartments, what their walk to work is like, and how they work their job in the factory. By the end of the story, we care about Boo's connection to Sully, because we see how his point of view changes throughout the film, and the ending scene leaves it open-ended for the viewer to decide what happens next, but wraps up the narrative the story is telling in a satisfying way. I have other Pixar content on this channel, and if you'd like to check it out, I have a video on how every Pixar short fits into the Pixar theory, and I also have another video about how the Monsters, Inc. bonus DVD confirms the Pixar theory. I do a lot of Pixar reviews, speculation, and theories on this channel, so if you'd like to check it out, feel free to do so. Anyways, goodbye. Oh, 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 oh,